All right, welcome. So how many of you would consider yourself a vendor or a service provider with a channel? Okay, yeah, you guys, yeah, you would raise your hands, all of you. All right, how many of you would consider yourself a partner who works with the vendor or the service provider in the channel? How many of you would consider yourself a distributor or a master agent? Anybody else we missed? All right, so we have a good mix. So as a former channel chief who logged lots of miles, how many, your, how many miles are you logging a year these days? 200,000, right, those. What my, one of my favorite CEO friends, who's now the CEO of Fortinetti said, there are two jobs in organizations in the front end of the business that are brutal and you can never make everyone happy. It's the channel chiefs and the services VPs. So we have the, we've had those jobs that we never make everybody happy all the time, but we certainly try. So I am delighted to introduce a friend, quite a humorous man, very intelligent. Let's see, what else could we say about Mr. Larry Walsh? He is a real thought leader in all seriousness in our industry. He does a fantastic job. So welcome, Larry, to come moderate this for us today. Uh, by the way, we are gonna take questions throughout, so if you have a burning question, ask it. Larry can handle it. Yeah, I can handle that, okay. I, I think. You know, I'm still sober. Um, good morning, everybody. Hey, I'm Larry Walsh. I'm a channel holic. So I do. Come on, a little bit. She said I was humorous. I have to live up to it now. Um, yeah, let's get past this. You know, one of the things that uh, 2112, we work with vendors, distributors, solution providers, basically everybody in the business, and solving the big problems. And one of the things that companies have asked us for over the past year, year and a half or so, is to tell them what the future is going to look like. So where are we going to be in the next five years or so? And we've been studying this, and we found that there are a number of things that are influencing the future. Now, I'm just going to tell you straight up, nobody knows what the future is, what the future is going to look like. We have no reliability beyond 24 months to be able to project out what's going to happen. But we can say that there are things that are influencing the, what the future is going to be. So if you look at just from a technology perspective, there are things that are absolutely obvious with this. Cloud computing is ha it continues to have a tremendous impact as we go into the third wave of cloud services. Mobility continues to have a tremendous impact. If you start looking at the development of SD-WAN and uh, 5G networks and how that's going to impact not only technology delivery systems, but also the de development of new products and new services that will be coming to market. Um, automation is one of these things that is absolutely fascinating as we start seeing more and more the digital transformation of enterprises and businesses that is, trans that is actually filtering down into the SMB level. We are, if something isn't move, is being moved by a human, it's soon gonna be moved by a machine. That machine's gonna be controlled by software. And through that, you know, when you start thinking about things like Internet of Things, it also feeds into automation. Every one of these IP-enabled devices is what I like to describe as data factories. You know, these are just devices that are churning out packets and packets and packets of information. That is the fuel that is going to drive the next, the next iteration of our economy. Now, before, I'm going to pause there just for a minute and say, how many of you, given what's happened with Facebook over the past couple of weeks, how many of you have gone and downloaded your archives? Come on. Yeah. And what did you find? You found everything. You found everything you already shared. You knew, this is the big joke about the Facebook download and the Google download you can do too, is that all the information that Elaine you see is what you've already shared with them. What you're not seeing is all the intelligence that's derived from that. And that's what big data is going to be doing for us, is that it's the data that we're sharing is the fuel that's going to power all the intelligence going forward. And that's what comes out of big data. And then the other thing that we're going to see is that continuing in importance is security. Now, I just came from the RSA conference in San Francisco, and I can tell you there's 60,000 people up there doing, talking about nothing about the next generation of security. Because all of this needs to have security and privacy baked around it. The market forces, you know, the technology is just part of this, but we also have market forces that are reshaping the way that we're approaching, approaching technology sales and technology delivery and ultimately the technology channel. So we are seeing a de definitive decline in the transactional model. 
being able to just sling boxes off of loading docks or you know, push them off the shelves is going away. We're having more and more, every, almost every company in the market is looking to move to some form of as a service model because there's a lot of benefits that come from it. And you hear it every, all the time at conferences like this. You've got to get on that recurring revenue model. And you also see the, the right now what we see is a, an increasing importance of automated digital sales. Now that's just a fancy way of describing Amazon. So we're going to be seeing more and more marketplaces coming in, disrupting traditional reseller models and uh, traditional channel models. And then we're also going to see, because of that, disruption in the ranks that's going to, incre that's going to lead to decre uh, increased competition and pressure on the, existing, on the remaining partners in the market. Look around, you see how this then reshapes the world around us. There are global and economic implications for all of this. You know, you, we, I did a workshop a couple of weeks ago with some channel chiefs and we started talking about, well, what does it matter, you know, the impact of globalization? What does it matter that you start seeing, you know, an influx of millennials, you start seeing an aging of a population? It's because this is reshaping the buyer. These trends are reshaping not only how we source product, but how we deliver it and who's consuming it from us. It reshapes the, uh, the economic equations on cost, profitability, and value. And it's also these same factors are reshaping expectations. And through these expectations, we have to react in designing programs, designing go-to-market models, designing value propositions that will resonate with the next generation of customers. What does this mean for all of us? And one of the, you know, this is a phrase that always gives me, uh, you know, gives me shivers when I hear people talking about burning platforms. When I hear somebody say burning platform, they're looking for a reason to move because if you look at the pace of change, we can look and say that the pace of change is rapid. We're seeing a lot of things. If we look around and we say, what did the world like, look like just five years ago? It looks vastly different than it does today, but we perceive it as very slowly. But I can tell you that we're seeing this pace over the next five years. There is going to be a rapid change in the way that, we, the way that this industry looks, the way that we operate, the way that we interact with each other. And in fact, our estimate is up to 60% of reseller businesses, we have defined that as VARs, MSPs, integrators, agents, are at risk of disruption because of the commoditization of certain products and the shift to these new business models. So we have to start thinking about how do we react and how do we plan and anticipate what that's going to look like and how do we mean, remain viable going forward. So that's what we want to talk about today, is what's the road ahead? You know, what do we need to think about in terms of changing routes to market? What do we need to think about in terms of our composition of the marketplace around us, in terms of the types of partners that are in market? For your perspective, what, is the, what, is your, what does your competition look like? What does your customer look like? And how do you structure and plan, not just because you can't just look at this and say, you know, at one point I'm going to flip a switch and then I'm going to become something else. We have to plan for these changes over time so that we don't disrupt ourselves because one of the things that happens is almost in, invariably, companies that try to disrupt themselves fail. We need to plan transitions, plan them wisely because Newton's third law of motion, in order to move something forward, we have to leave something behind. So you do that through a phase transition of the things that we do today will become less important over time until you reach an inflection point of where the new things will take over. And companies that are able to plan that transition, that up-down transition, are the ones who will be successful going forward. So, with that, we brought this esteemed panel together, and I assure you that they all too are sober like me. <laughs> and we're going to talk about these issues for the next, uh, Teresa, how much time do we have? Five, six hours? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> there will be no bathroom breaks. We will not be bringing lunch in. So the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to talk about these issues. And I encourage you, as we go through, I have a long list of questions and topics to go through, and I really hope you do not let me get to them. If you, have, if you have questions as we go along, please make this interactive. This is for your benefit. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of institutional knowledge on this panel. 
and we can share with you, you know, and, and through conversation, open conversation, we'll all learn together. So with that, I want to start by asking my panel to introduce yourself. Tara, why don't you start with us from Get Wireless? I'm Tara Bastelich. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Get Wireless. We're a value-added distributor in the Internet of Things technology. Excellent. Bob Chrisman. Down the room. I'm Bob Chrisman. I'm the uh, Senior VP uh, Global Channel Chief for Vonage. Um, I think most people are probably familiar with Vonage, but we really are thinking of ourselves as you think of the future. We're an enterprise software company that offers solutions and better business outcomes to our customers and look forward to working with all of you to do that. Hey everybody, I'm Tina Gravel, Senior VP of Channels and Alliances globally for Sixtera, the world's largest and most secure infrastructure company in the world. Um, I want to shout out two things. Alliance of Channel Women, Go Girls, and also Cloud Girls. So any women that are in here, if you're not a member, please, uh, please hit us up for more information on that. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Rob Ray, Vice President of Business Development with Datto. A uh, couple things. First of all, I know you're all thinking the same thing. Larry's collar is intentionally up. Apparently, that's the new design. So, oh, yeah. What's that all about? <laughs> what is that all about, Larry? I know you're all looking at it going, is that a thing? Right. That's not supposed to be so, like that. It is absolutely supposed Larry, to be Larry like educated this. me this morning. Apparently, that's how they all wear it in China these days. So. <laughs> um, I work, uh, I, I've had the... Uh, We're giving game. dollars away to pick on Larry, too, throughout <laughs> the session. I'm just going to so sit easy, here. So you all can take your shots. <laughs> when you see him throughout the conference for the rest of the day, go up and try to fix it for him. Will you do that? Um, Vice President of Business Development with a company called Datto. And if you're not familiar with Datto, uh, we are actually only a 10-year-old organization. Um, we literally started in the founder, which is uh, just a really smart engineer, started in his parents' basement eight, ten years ago, um, and most recently uh, were involved in a multi-billion dollar acquisition uh, and merger. Uh, we are and have been for the last eight to ten years focusing exclusively on managed service providers as our go-to-market strategy, so we only sell to the channel. Uh, most recently, we brought in the Autotask fold of products, and now we've got backup disaster recovery, which is kind of our core product, SaaS protection as we've evolved towards cloud. Um, obviously, with Autotask, we've got the RMMs, the PSAs, all the tools that you guys need in order to run your businesses. So um, I just can say that we literally have built our entire business off of the channel platform, off of managed services being our go-to-market strategy. Larry? Cool. Please, you want to try now? No. Okay. It won't go down. This is made of bamboo. It's made of bamboo. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about this. As I said, we had a, you know, I, I listed a few things that are, that are having an influence on market outcomes. Things that are making, that are reshaping the world around us that will ultimately reshape the channel and reshape business models of, that all of you have to operate with. So why don't we start, Rob, because you, as you said, you went through a multi-billion dollar acquisition to get you guys out of a garage. Yeah. So why don't you tell us about what do you see as the change agents that are affecting your MSPs? Uh, I've, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to be in this industry for... Uh, 20, 25 years now, um, and one of the one of the things that I've noticed though, throughout the course of my career, yes, I'm Canadian. You can hear my outs already. Um, one of the things that I've noticed throughout my career is is that this is a constant evolution, constant evolution. We have to constantly look at the way in which we're doing business. And when I started, recurring revenue wasn't a thing. Services revenue wasn't a thing. It was pure margins on product. So you know, heading towards the at least managed services, growing that recurring revenue is is absolutely essentially key. And then you start figuring out what your go-to-market strategy is around that. And of course, we've seen things like you know, performing services, multi-year contracts, then the emergence of the cloud, and then the cloud gets more complicated. And we're on one of those, uh, on those trips right now, uh, really, really deep from a security perspective. Security is awesome. And it's a brand new messaging. Um, specifically, we focus on the SMB market. And the SMB is a very, very underserved market when it comes to things like security, because that's going to be an afterthought. Uh, everybody wants to go straight to the enterprise, get the big dollars. But when you can figure out an SMB play around security and wrapping security offerings around what it is that you sell, what it is that you offer, that's where we're seeing significant growth in, in guys that have even been somewhat plat plateaued for like the last five years. Now, all of a sudden, they start telling a security story and they're seeing rapid growth. Tina, why don't we come, because you deal in cloud and you also deal in security, do you find those that, what are the things that are re, re, making you rethink the way that you engage with partners and rethinking your models? 
You can tell she read the briefing material. <laughs> no, I did. I, I did read it, and I thought about it, and I read, and I watched. And one of the fun facts I got was from an organization you guys probably have never heard of uh, called 2112. Okay? <laughs> and they say that in Damn 20, liars. 2023, the, um, our channel will be significantly impacted to this automation mm -hmm. related to the elephant in the room. Amazon, right? And all the ways marketplaces are serving. Okay, so so there is there is a need for an easy way. What's happened is we've all become trained to do things in a way that is simple and fast. I'm on my phone, I put the thumb down and it opens. No longer password, right? Um, everything I do has to be fast, has to be quick, has to be easy. Our customers want that too. And so we are building, a, I just got out of meetings this week. I told everybody on the team, don't call me. I've got to finish this. I created the Alliance program because we haven't had one. We're only, you know, you say 10 years. I've been in business 10 months. How do you like that, right? So 10 months and we had a channel program because we inherited channel from CenturyLink, but we didn't have alliances. And so what I, I had to do is create something. And the big linchpin of all of this is the marketplace. Yeah. Because without that, customers may not buy the things that our alliance partners are selling. Right. Right? Yeah. I hope so, I answered your question. No, you did. Yeah, and just for everybody to know, we did invite Amazon to be here, but they weren't available through Prime and couldn't get here within 48 hours. So. Ah, very good. Yeah. Bob, you have an evolving channel as well through Vonage. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the change agents you're seeing? What's influencing your strategies? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I always start a very brilliant person that I had the opportunity to, to work for at one point, you know, said, always start with the customer, start with the customer. What does the customer want? If you start with the customer, you can never go wrong. What we're seeing is what customers are demanding. Customers do not wake up in the morning in our situation and say, I need a new phone system. They just, they don't. Um, they wake up in the morning and they say, given some of the things you talked about on the slides, my gosh, Amazon's coming and eating my lunch. You know, these people are getting to market faster. These people know their customers better than me. When they wake up in the morning, they're trying to figure out, how can I know my customer better? How can I serve them better? How can I get to market faster? So I, I think you got to start with that. Because all the technology stuff, speeds, feeds, bits, bytes, cloud, not cloud, the end customer, the, the chief marketing officer, the CFO, they don't really care about that stuff. They don't care about all those pieces to get there. What they care about is solve my problem for me. So the evolution we're going through is, is, you know, and you hit on it, we have to move from a transactional world to what I call a trusted advisor world. We have to go in and not sell stuff. We have to go in and talk with customers and find out what are their pain points? What do they care about? What's keeping them up at night? What are they thinking about when they wake up in the morning? If you just go in and try to sell them a faster this or a quicker that or a cloud that, again, I think you're missing the bigger opportunity. So I think what we need to do, and this, this isn't something new, we really need to go back and think about how do I solve a business problem? Because that's really what these customers want. And the way you do that, it's generally not the technology I have or you have or you have, it's how you bring those things together. So you listed all these technology trends. Again, great, but I think the magic here and the opportunity you all have how do you stitch those together? How do you bring them together and hide the complexity? Because making something simple is actually the hardest thing to do with technology, right? So how do you go and how do you take security? How do you go and, and, and take core infrastructure? How do you go and take CRM systems? How do you take communications? And how do you bring it all together so that person that you're talking to that's not technical that goes, gosh, I wish I could do something better, that you can explain it to them in their words. So I think if I were you know, a, a, a partner, if I were out there running my business, I'd really be thinking about how do I turn it inside out? How do I get more customer focused? And how do I build these solutions for them? Because if you're in a model where you're like an agency model, you, what you're really good at is you're selling. Sell, 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 and that's great. How do you either build this capacity to build, to build the solutions? How do you partner with somebody to do it? Or how do you maybe buy somebody, right? Maybe you buy somebody that has that capacity, but you gotta figure out how you can bring those solutions together for your customers. Because I think if you don't, you're gonna be one of the statistics that you referred to up there. Yeah. You know, so before we move on, Tara, I wanna, I wanna ask you, because you have what I think is one of the most exciting pieces of this in the IoT. So do you ha see IoT bringing in a new set of requirements that, is gonna re that makes you rethink the way that you engage with, with your customers and your partners? 
So, I mean, we've been facing challenges in the IoT space for quite a while. I mean, we look at as it's been evolving. So we're a distributor. We sell primarily to channel partners. We sell to VARs, system integrators, resellers of all kinds, um, and we work with operators, right? So we look at all of these partners and building these programs to try to bring all these pieces together. Like you said, somebody has to bring those pieces together and help them find the best solution. So at Get Wireless, we have a, a portfolio of top vendors, right? So we've built our business from working with industry leading vendors and picking those vendors that are going to be um, pieces of the puzzle, right? So we sell uh, hardware technology partners. We have um, products from CR Wireless and Peplink and Airgain and Calamp and a lot of the leading IoT providers. But then we work with also, um, you know, service providers and we have different um, options for channel programs for you guys in the channel to now bring those pieces together and really create that value. And I think that's where the value in the channel is, is bringing those partners together. And because IoT is all about the ecosystem. It's all about the different pieces. Not everybody does every piece of an IoT solution. And somebody has to be there to herd those cats together and make them work together, right? We sell some of the top leading technology from CR Wireless for routers and gateways and things like that. But they don't work if you don't put a SIM card in them, right? So if we don't work with operators and we don't work with the agents and, and work to get connectivity on them, they hold the papers down on your desk, right? So we, all of these pieces coming together, and that's what we've been working through with our business model and working with our partners. The second part of that is in the IoT space is that you're challenged, right? We've all deployed 2G products, now we go to 3G products, 4G, you mentioned 5G. You know, how do we deploy products now for public safety and mobility and, and first net, things like that. So it's really an evolution of how do you put them all together and how do you keep that going as the technology changes? Yeah. Tina. So I am uh, just getting into the IoT space with, my, with our company on the security side of things. But I'm an enthusiast of Chris, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, and I speak and um, love to talk about it. And I will tell you that each device adds a complexity to our environment from a security standpoint that we've never seen before. The firmware on these things, as you know, the break, the, the issue, uh, the security issue that was had was just due to not up, updating the, the firmware on, on, you know, a device. Let me ask you something, everybody in this room who has a smart television, do you think about updating your firmware? Do you know that the company that you're working with, that you bought the television from, is updating their firmware? I mean, we don't think this way. So there's a, a sea change of thought, I think, a real uh, different perspective that you have to have. No longer are you protected in the ways that you used to be protected, and that's because of IoT and the internet and all of these things that blow away our, the four walls we used to have of security in our homes or in our businesses, right? Yeah. It's called yeah. the zero trust model is what we yeah. like to talk about. Yeah, I'm actually terrified of my smartphone and my car getting together and leaving me on the side of the road. So <laughs> let, let's shift up on this because it, it's, I do think that all these trends are, are reshaping the way that we go to market. And Tina, you referenced this, uh, that we did, 2112 did release a report this week on the impact of marketplaces that are going to have on all of your businesses. By 2023, 11% of the vendors tell us that the majority of their indirect revenue will come from marketplaces like Amazon. That means if 11% say top, that means it will be two and three for others. So, Bob, you're shaking your head. What do you, what do you think is that, do, do the changes in the way the technology will force us to rethink our routes to market as well and then reshape, reshape our channel relationships? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the marketplaces are happening. We know that you can see it now, whether it's Amazon or you could look at an Ingram Micro has a multi-billion dollar marketplace, et cetera. They're out there. So I think if you're a, 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 a partner, if you're running a business, if, it goes back to you need to add more value. Just resellings, that's not adding value anymore because the marketplaces are doing that. You can go to these marketplaces and, and buy anything. If you just want to buy some bits, you can go to a marketplace and do it, and you're going to get a great deal because they have a volume that they can get these great deals on. I think it goes back to you got to add value. And how do you add value? Be the trusted advisor. Go, don't just go and sell a bit, put the solution together, because that's adding value that the marketplaces can't do. All right, do. so let me push back on that, because, uh -huh. you know, Rob, you've said that as well. You know, we've been saying trusted advisor yep. for 
Um, so Overused my, term. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we said trusted advisor when my hair was a different color. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is it that we, <laughs> what makes this different to say trusted advisor? What does that mean? You know, does that mean that you're going to be looking for a different type of partner? I, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I mean, what's, what's kind of funny about all this is it all comes full circle. At the end of the day, a lot of this comes down to the relationships you have with your customers, right? A marketplace doesn't have a relationship with the customer. People have relationships with customers. So I go back to, you need to have a model where you're not just selling it, knocking on doors, moving on to the next thing, moving on to the next thing. That's not adding value. You have to figure out what is your unique value proposition? What can you bring to the table that not only a marketplace can't bring, but your competitors can't bring either, right? I mean, we've got a room full of people here. Some of you are competing against each other. What can you do? What makes you unique? And how do you message that out? Now, part of the way you do that, you go to these marketplaces and there's tens of thousands of things you can do. Be selective about who you partner with. Be selective about the vendors you represent. Represent, work with vendors that are best of breed, if you will. If you can bring together the best of breed pieces, Versus if you just go and say, well, yeah, I can do all those 10,000 things, you, you, that's peanut butter and you're not differentiating yourselves. Think about the vendors you want to do business with. Think about what they bring to the table technologically. Think about economically, are they going to be around for the long haul? If you're in a model where you're in a residual based model where your business model is, I make this residual. I was just talking with a partner last night about this. If you're partnering with somebody, a provider, a vendor, that's going to have financial difficulties and have to change the residuals they put out there. They go, hey, that, that $10 used to get turned into one. It's not going to help you a whole lot. So really think about what does the vendor bring to the table technologically? Do they have a lasting business model? Are they somebody that's going to be good to their word and you can trust? And when you narrow that down, you're adding value because it isn't just the 10,000 different things there. You're adding value. And then how do you stitch them together better than anybody else? And what's an angle you take, whether it's a vertical or I'm going to go deep in security or whatever it might be, pick something versus trying to be everything to everyone. Yeah. Ron. Uh. <laughs> do, you, no, no. do you need a minute? No, no, no. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm. Um, that was a Canadian grunt. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I do agree with a lot of what you're actually saying, though. Uh, I'm coming at it from a completely different angle, which is, again, the SMB route. And the SMB route, you can't verticalize that easy because there just isn't enough busy or business to, to choose a specific vertical in some cases. So um, we need to be everything to everyone. And, and that means, and, and kind of similar to what you said there, it means going and selecting good vendors. I think what, where the key or where the catch for us is, is when we look at the SMB space and look at the, 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 the services that you provide there, you know, the, the vehicle in which you use to get there is fine, uh, which would be your marketplace. The, the tools that you have in your toolbox, of course, are, are fine, which are the vendors that you got. And at the end of the day, like you said, it comes down to the service that you provide, the relationship that you have with your customers. Um, trusted advisor is banned in the managed services space, by the way. We, we're not allowed to say that anywhere anymore. So. Um, that being said, uh, I think where the key for the SMB uh, sale is, is just basically staying ahead of everybody else. And that means like being very adventuresome, looking at some of those newer vendors that are coming into the place. You want to find those vendors that are actually stable and are going to be around for a long time uh, and not acquired or eaten by very large organizations which are going to destroy the technology, which has happened several times. We've seen it, especially in the MSP space. But more so, um, what can you do to differentiate yourself? And that doesn't necessarily come from the relationship you build. It could potentially come from the education or the tools that you provide. And I'll give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about here. Um, I do a lot, obviously, in the managed services space. I log about 200,000 miles a year traveling around the world. I go to trade show after trade show, do panel after panel, presentation after presentation. So I get the opportunity to talk to tens of thousands of MSPs, solution providers, and vendors. And then I hit up a trade show recently in November and I walk into this trade show and it's the same hotel every single year and it's the same stupid lobby bar every single year and then I've noticed that half the vendors that are there are companies I have never heard of. Never. So I start walking around and talking to these vendors and realize they are all coming at it from a security perspective. Even better, they're coming at the channel with a security play. Now, these are well-established organizations. They've been making money for a number of years, potentially selling direct, potentially selling in the enterprise, but they've discovered this whole channel now and they're coming here. So just because you've never heard of a company, say like ID Agent, and then all of a sudden you come across them and you think this is just a brand new rinky-dink vendor, it's not. They have a phenomenal approach to how to go to your customers with a security play on dark web. Like when you realize that and all of a sudden you add that in it, 
$200, $300 a month, which is nothing, but you're going to scrape the dark web for passwords for your end user, that's a differentiator that you now have versus Joe Blow computers down the street. And that's where being adventuresome and trying to find those new angles and trying to work with those new vendors and find that angle is going to be the key to staying in business, evolving, and eventually winning. I know you're like chomping at the bit. You want to grab this? I got a great story. Can I tell the story, please? All right, all right. right, Two minutes. All right. The cloud. Um, There are people in here that still don't sell cloud. I know that for a fact. Okay. They're not comfortable with selling cloud. They maybe don't even sell co-location, which to me is the easiest thing in the world to sell. And, um, and that's sad because honestly, they're, they're, putting, they're leaving money on the table. I want to tell you a quick story. In 2008, I was at Terramark and we invented a cloud there. Um, Amazon had just come out with their cloud. We did it because we saw things going on with VMware that made perfect sense to us and we needed a way to reach our co-location customers without going to the data center. That's it. And we also wanted a way to sell our managed services cu- you know, customers something they didn't have. So we came up with this thing and we called it the cloud because that's what Amazon was doing. And I sold the first one with a partner by accident, okay? Because I didn't know anything about it either. We were just doing our best to try to pull it all together and it was changing the world, right? And we didn't quite know what to say. And you're, what you said was so right on because if you cannot make these concepts understandable and bring them down to the lowest common denominator, people can't sell them, question, no question. All right, so, so let me finish the story. Okay. So we right, sold Don't this. hurt me. No, let me finish. Larry, put that collar back. It's All a right, really good so start. go, Tina. So, wait, do you hear this? So, we sold the first one, the first commercial with CDW, and the guy that sold that with me, who also by accident bumped into it, was Drew Lidecker. Does everybody know who Drew Lidecker is? Mostly everybody does, right? He built the company Avant, and he built it on the back of cloud. And if he hadn't worked with me on that deal, I'm not saying I have responsibility for his business. Bro, trust me, I've tried to collect on this for years. But I will say this, that he, if he hadn't been brave enough and to try something different that maybe he didn't have all the answers about, but step into traffic with a customer and say, you know what, I don't know everything, but this sounds like something you could really benefit from. Do you know that customer is still a customer of what became Terramark, what became Verizon, what now is IBM? I mean, that all those years, all that revenue, You know, and so what I'm going to challenge you guys with is what he said. Learn something. It doesn't have to be vertical. It could be a horizontal solution. It could be a way of collaborating, a way of integrating, whatever. But don't stop learning this stuff. Don't say, well, I'll just take the orders and be like every other lousy VAR out there. Please don't do that. You're better than that. See, that's a good segue because I planned on He wants to shut me up. (laughs) I've been there. I see myself losing control at this point. <laughs> no, you got this, so, Larry. So, Tara, Bob, I want to, because I think this is a good transition because I was going to delve into what is the composition of the partner community going forward? What are you looking for? But I, I don't want to get into a nomenclature discussion. What is the attributes of what we're looking for? Because I agree with what Tina's saying, is that one of the things that we see when we, when we look at the landscape, it's not that we don't see that they're not, it's under 10% that's not selling cloud, it's that they sell a cloud or something cloud-ish and they stop. So what are the, Tina, or Tara, what are the attributes that you're looking for or you think need to happen and within the partners in order for them to be relevant going forward? Well, I think the biggest thing that we're working on is just getting people to pick a title and stick with it, right? To, to pick your lane, right? So talking about where, where do you fit in the market and deciding what that is, right? Everybody says that they're a distributor, everybody says they're a reseller, they're a system integrator, they're an MSP. I mean, there's so many different titles, right? And again, at the end of the day, you have to pick what your business model is and be really true to that model and really define that model. Because when you start to wander and waver into other areas, you're not as good at your core competency. So that's one of the, the key things that we're really trying to work th- through. And then again, these partners in the middle, I mean, they're, they're starting to dabble in these, in these other areas, right? So So being able to just say, our partner community is a series of resellers, system integrators, um, we're, we're working directly with operators as well that are putting these solutions together. So we're looking for partners that are looking for the top technology vendors 
from um, hardware, software, uh, connectivity, all of these pieces, and have the ability and the expertise to put these together. You know, we work a lot with mobility and outfitters, right, you know, that are doing vehicles, right? How many police cars need technology in them, right? A lot, right? And they want the leading vendors in that space, and they need the right person in the right company that has the expertise to be able to put those solutions together. So that's really what we're looking for is, is whatever market or whatever vertical you are, being able to take those technology solutions, eliminate the chaos and noise and all of the discussions that come from every vendor that's pitching why their product is better, right, is really being able to bring those together, show that value, and, and do the actual work of getting it into a car or into a bus or into um, a, a, a nursing home facility or whatever it may be that's actually critical. Yeah, yeah it's, it's professional services capabilities and capacity at the end of the day, right? Yeah. So it goes back to you can, it's a very diff, a different P&L model. So you as a business owner, if you own your business, a professional services model is really different than a, a reseller or an agent model. So can you blend those two together? Or again, do you partner with somebody, especially if you look at a lot of the, the quote unquote born in the cloud guys that do development all day long, they don't know how to sell. Yeah. That, that's an opportunity, right? So if you can come together with the guys that are technically great, that know microservices architectures, that know how to build things off of AWS, et cetera, et cetera, that's all great, but they don't know how to sell it. So get together with them and figure out, hey, I know how to sell things. I have relationships with customers. How do you marry the two of those together? That, that's If I were sitting in your chairs as a partner, I'd be trying to figure out how I, I bring those relationships together. Maybe you end up buying them, I don't know. But how do you work together that way? But do you think, though, is that it's still gonna be a blended mix of selling commoditized and complex products, or do you think that there needs to be a shift exclusively to those products that require that value add? I, I, it's, it's, it's never an either or. I mean, there, there's, it's never an either I'm or. sorry, it's, I need to move back, because Tina wants to talk. Oh. <laughs> All right, so. No, I just, I just got the two minute warning. Oh. oh. Yeah, so, 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 so the quick would be, I don't think it's an either or, I think two? it's a both. I think what happens is the more complex pulls through the commodity. The commodity, um, that's fine, it's not where you're going to differentiate yourselves, but there's certain things you're always going to need. So you start with the solution and it pulls through everything else. So it's not an either or, you've got to be able to do both. Okay, so before... I know why, I know why they pay them the big bucks now. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty good. But... All right, so before we move forward, Teresa, how much time do we have? You have two minutes and then we're going to do Q&A. Two minutes and Q&A, okay. So, uh, where am I at? So much content. All right, let's just go with distribution. I, know, I mean, I, I told you this was going to be it. Future of distribution. Does distribution still play a role going forward? Absolutely. That's what you would say? Absolutely. Okay, tell us why. Get Wireless is built, we built our business in distribution, right? Distributors have to exist because they're the, the, especially in IoT, it's complicated, right? And we have brought to, to the market a term of what we consider as value-added distribution. Right? There's tier one distribution, there's tier two distribution, there's, you know, there's a lot of different options, but we look at it and we say, in, in particular, in the channel space for IoT, broadline distribution absolutely will not work. There is too much service, there is too much complexity, and there's too much change. Okay. So we adamantly believe that, that that will always be a play in this. We built our business since 2001 in a townhome basement, and we are the largest partner of some of the, the top players in IoT, like Sierra Wireless and Airgain and Peplink, I mean, all of these major players that we represent, um, it, it's really the key to getting those products to market. Okay. Rob, 30 seconds. What are the changing expectations for partners from a vendor's perspective? What do they need to do to satisfy you? Oh, good. I'm glad you didn't ask me the distribution one, because yeah. people would start hating on me on that. <laughs> um, uh, what do they need to change? Okay, so first of all, uh, it's constantly, so uh, technology is complex. What your job is, is to, to, in essence, dumb it down. We gotta make it so stupid simple so that the partners that are selling it, the ultimate end user of the product, understands what it is that it does, how it works, and what it's gonna do for me. And we have to make that message so simple. And we talk about, and I think it was Bob that mentioned, you know, the cloud uh, guys that are actually down there developing all this stuff, but don't know how to make money because they can't sell it because they can't simplify what it is that they're actually doing, even though they're doing wonderful work. So that's what we need to do. And, and that comes through education, that comes through educating yourself. What you're also being paid to do is you're also being paid to stay on top of everything that is going on out there, those new innovations that are coming down. What does this all mean? 
mean? And you know, instead of the typical catchphrases throughout the entire industry, redefine that. You know, Internet of Things is one, that's great. Go to your customer and talk about Internet of Things, their heads are spinning. You gotta, in essence, define what that actually means and what you can do for it and make it so stupid simple that people now understand that their smart refrigerators are part of the Internet of Things, those kinds of things. All right. Um, sorry, very quickly. One of the things that I will task each of you doing is going to that vendor showcase, go find five vendors you've never heard of before and understand their technology. Because there's gold in them hills, it's just a matter of who's going to find it first. And that is going to come through a lot of those new emerging vendors that have found out and figured out better ways to give this messaging. Okay. Tina, 20 seconds. Okay. Go, I, 20, go, no, different question. Just, okay. Different question. So going forward, I have to get through these slides, otherwise I look stupid. All right. So five years from now, deal registration, dead or alive? Oh, alive more than ever. Okay. That's and, it? Okay. And, and you know why? If you're really selling and you don't claim and work your customer over time, why not just sell it on a marketplace? Why not just, yeah. you know what? You got to own Good. the customer. All right. Uh, you ready for uh, questions Georgia. from the group? Bring it on. Anybody have one burning? Right here. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, good. Yeah, I'm listening. To, yeah. What? Oh, there we go. So, Bob, you said you were uh, an enterprise software company, um, which is an interesting uh, characterization. I'm curious, how do you differentiate yourself and your products versus others? Are you looking to, you know, actively acquire your differentiation of products, whether they be collaboration or other things, or are you offering a suite of them and just stitching them together based on what the client needs? Uh, so, so, so first thing is, we do think of ourselves as an enterprise software company, because in, in, in the space uh, where a lot of our revenue comes from unified communications, you know, I can go and tell you why I think we're different than the other four guys, but at the end of the day, they're pretty similar, actually. There isn't a lot of differentiation there. So we're trying to solve the bigger problem. And it goes back to, in our case, I don't think somebody wakes up in the morning and says, I need a new phone system, or I don't like my dial tone. They want the bigger thing. So what we're trying to do is we've gone out a combination of acquisition and building from within, tried to bring together a bigger solution. So we have something called communication platform as a service. When you bring that together with unified communications, cool things can happen. We believe communications becomes this, the thread, if you will, that can go and solve a lot of these larger problems. So what if you, know, you can go and you can have your, your unified communications platform connected in with your CRM system, with your ERP systems, et cetera? What if you can go and the folks in your contact center you have, you're taking advantage of AI technology. So as they're on the phone with somebody, based on keywords they're using, based on tone of voice, you can start to tell, you know, uh-oh, I've got an escalation that's gonna happen here. How can you head that off? We can actually do those things today. So it's again, how do you solve that larger problem? And how do you not just think of within the company, but how do you think of B2B to C, if you will? How do you connect to the customer at the end? And how do you make it so your customers can have that intimacy with their customers? How can they get to market faster? And that's kind of at the high level. But in every market, people are trying to figure All that right, out. You're and running put out of time. Own words. You know, how do you do that? And we think we can do that. That's how we're differentiating ourselves versus just playing the commodity. So we probably have time for one more quick one. Anyone? No? All right, Larry, you want to make any final comments? Yeah, actually, I do. I want to ask, you know, because as I started off the, the discussion, is that the market and the channel as we saw it five years ago doesn't look anything, this, anything like it does five years ago as it does today. So looking forward five years from now, what do you think the channel is going to look like? Tara. Always a five-year question, right? But <laughs> I, think the ch I, mean, I think our channel is going to evolve. I think there's, there's going to be um, more partners coming into the channel, but they're going to offer, offer different types of value. And the one piece I would leave everybody with today is we talk about selling value, and everybody wants to be a consultant and an expert. But I think what we're all looking at is actually selling fear, right? We all become agent, like insurance agents, right? And we say, what if your phone system doesn't work? What if your police car connectivity system doesn't work? What if your ambulance can't communicate to the hospital? What if this happens? I can solve that for you, right? That's where that value comes in. And if you can talk to your customers about their fears, right, we all get a lot more revenue and it's not counseling. Yeah. Bob? <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, my crystal ball is as good as all of yours. Um, you know, the, the, the only, you know, the, the only constant is change in this space. I think you have to be willing to change. I think all of these different models, you know, you can call them VARs or SIs or SPs or agents. 
I believe it's all going to converge, to tell you the truth. I think those five years from now, you know, if, if I were guessing is, you're not going to have those labels anymore. It's going to converge together, and those that can get there fastest are going to win. Okay. okay. Tina? Yeah, I, I just want to say I'm the worst predictor known to me, and I didn't think client server was going to happen, and then Microsoft was just a toy no one would use for a business app, and then, of course, the Internet was just ridiculous. I never, ever, I pick the trends by accident because I have good friends that I listen to that know something, like Larry and like a guy right here, Jim Libs. You, you listen to your, the smart people and see what what makes them most excited about what's going on in technologies and, and start to gravitate that way because they, they know if you don't. And the last thing I will say is that um, please don't be afraid to let your vendor decide where to spend the MDF dollars. I'm sick of a cocktail party, okay? I know it's fun to go to a cocktail party, but let me tell you something. We need to train your people. Stop asking us to give money for things that won't get any, you won't get value out of, you really won't. You're not gonna benefit from a cocktail party. I'm sorry, I'm tired of it. <laughs> All right. You. Rob, last week. Oh, there's so much to unpack there. Um, <laughs> I, I was, uh, I'll give you a quick little anecdote and I'll, I'll explain where it's coming from. I was uh, uh, at an event in Nashville, Tennessee six, seven years ago and there's a gentleman who was a very well-known gentleman in the, in the community, got on stage in front of a bunch of SMP, uh, SMB MSPs um, and he said that if you're not in, in cloud in the next six months, I'm going to put all of you out of business. And he got ripped apart <laughs> by this group of about 700 MSPs. They literally took him to the parking lot and beat the crap out of him. Um, six months later, all those MSPs are still sitting in the room and that guy is nowhere to be found. Haven't heard from him in the last six years. So uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a revolution. This is not a revolution. As much as the vendors are gonna push you going, you gotta do this, you gotta do it, you gotta do it now, you gotta do it now, it's not that way. This is an evolution. And as long as you are continuing to learn and evolve, that is gonna be the key to staying in business. And it doesn't have to be a, mag a magnificent rip and replace out of anything. It doesn't need to be rebranding yourself as cloud or IoT, it doesn't mean anything like that. It is literally learning something new, adding something new every single year. Little pieces, little pieces, little pieces. Um, I met the uh, 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 CEO founder of Kayak and he actually said something that probably the only thing he said that actually stuck with me was that he spends 20% of his day experimenting. 20% of his website is an experiment. 20% of what he reads is something that he would traditionally wouldn't pick up. And that has been what has given him success in his career. I've started using that and leveraging that, especially if you have things like developers. Give them 20% of their time to play around with. It is awesome That's what you can idea. do yeah. with that. Good. So, that's a wrap. It is a wrap. That's so a wrap. Listen, I hope you all got hope a lot of this. Hope you found it valuable. Go ahead. Yeah. Listen, I... ...are going to be around for the rest of the event. Come check out the reports we have on 2112. They'll tell you a lot more about these insights. We have them. They're all freely...